doctor is out today. He is in Houston with his family. Somewhere around August, I'm sorry, around uh, July the 4th, he told me he was going to be out this weekend, and he asked me to rescue him as he could not be in two places at once. So I thought, well, you know what? If you're going to talk about a rescue, maybe I should talk about a rescue. So today we're going to be talking about rescues, and our text is coming from the Old Testament book of Hezekiah, chapter 13. I would ask you to please remember to pray for our pastor and his family as they travel. And next week he'll start a new series. So this time that he's out, we want him to be rested and relaxed and also charged and filled with God's Holy Spirit. Now let us look at our text in the book of Hezekiah, chapter 13. You know, it's said that many people open their Bible only once a week on Sunday morning in church. So I appreciate you having your Bible with you. Is everybody there? Has everybody found Hezekiah? Everybody there at Hezekiah, chapter 13. Um, you know, kind of getting some blank looks. What's what's the problem? We need to get to. We need to get going now. It's time for us to get going. Hezekiah chapter thirteen. What? No Hezekiah. Who cannot find? Who cannot find? Who has been searching for the book of Hezekiah? Oh my goodness! No Hezekiah. Wait a minute. Let me understand this. You have your Bible open, it's got a table of contents, you're looking through, and you cannot find the book of Hezekiah. Hmm. Well, allow me to rescue you. I will rescue you because there is no book of Hezekiah in the Bible. Which brings us to the first of several questions we will discuss today. The first question is, what is a rescue? I mean, if we're going to study rescues, we ought to define it, shouldn't we? We ought to have an idea of what we're talking about. What is a rescue? Well, one definition of rescue is to save something, to prevent something from being discarded, rejected, or put out of operation. Again, a rescue is to save something to prevent something from being discarded, rejected, or put out of operation. When I rescued you just now, I saved you from being embarrassed. I prevented you from feeling rejected. So I rescued you. You were searching for a book of the Bible and you couldn't locate it. I told you there's no such book of the Bible. And you were rescued from that embarrassment. We'll now read of another kind of rescue as found in our real text, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 34. I know you can locate the New Testament book of Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, verses 13 through 34. This is one of my favorite passages. It is the story of the original walk to Emmaus. If you don't have your Bible, the scripture will be projected on the screen behind me. Luke 24, beginning with verse 13, reads, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one man whose name was Cleopas answered him and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. 
Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, in this time that we have together this morning, Lord, I sincerely ask for your Holy Spirit. And maybe my voice is heard, but I pray it is your Holy Spirit that teaches this morning. In Jesus' name. On my way home from work, and there was this loud bang. And the next thing I remember, I, I woke up in a hospital. I've actually been told that a number of times. Maybe not those exact words, but something very similar. You see, I'm employed professionally as a licensed adjuster. I've been at it for 19 years now. A number of times people have told me something similar to that. All I remember was I was driving home from work. There was this loud bang. And the next thing I know, I was waking up in a hospital. When we think of a rescue, what usually comes to mind? This is our second question of the day. What do we usually think about when we think about a rescue? Perhaps it is a Coast Guard helicopter. Perhaps it's the dogs of life that use it in a tow truck crew or maybe by the police. Something like that may come to mind when you think of a rescue. As in the video clip that we just saw, you may think of someone injured in an accident, unable to assist himself or herself, and some trained technician comes to perform a rescue. That may be the first thing that comes to mind for you when you think about a rescue. Now, if that is true, that that kind of thought is the first thing that comes to mind, it's probably because that kind of rescue gets 
so much media coverage. You know, if there's a police or a helicopter or something that, that go into a scene, a lot of times you're going to drive by and you'll see a news crew there. That's because they usually listen to radio transmissions so that they can know where the emergency is and get the news crew there just as soon as possible so they can get the film on television. Some of you may have a very vivid memory of a video feed of a white Ford Bronco driving down the highway in California, being chased by a number of police cars. But several years before the O.J. Simpson incident, there was a little girl who fell down the shaft of a well in West Texas, and her recovery was covered by a television crew. And not too long ago, a number of men were trapped far underground in a mine, far underground, and the television crews that were there filmed the recovery attempts as well as their eventual rescue. So, with that kind of significant media coverage, it's only natural to think of this first when you are asked the question, what do we normally think of when we think about a rescue? So let's remember, however, that we gave a definition of a rescue as to save something, to prevent something from being discarded, rejected, or put out of operation. Now, with that definition in mind, let's look back at our text from Luke 24. Luke 24, 13 reads, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Now, here are two disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus Christ, making a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus. And they are sad. Why are they sad? They're sad because their hope was destroyed. They're sad because their hope was destroyed. Look at verse 21. But we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. Jesus had been crucified. And their hope was destroyed. And they were sad. The two disciples went on to tell the stranger who walked with them in the rest of verse 21. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Now, you have to think that right about that very second, Jesus wanted to go up to those two disciples and right on the back of the head. Hello? Wake up! He is alive. I'm He. I'm right here in front of you. I'm alive. Death is defeated. I'm risen, and I'm right here with you. We define a rescue as to save something, to prevent something from being discarded, rejected, or put out of operation. Jesus did just that with those two disciples walking to Emmaus. They were sad. Their hope was destroyed. That means they had lost all their hope. And Jesus said in verse 25, O foolish one, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. You know what? Those two disciples had no reason to be sad. They hadn't lost their hope. Their hope was standing right there next to them. Their hope was walking down the road with them. Their hope was alive and well. Their hope. Jesus joined them on their journey and he rescued them. Jesus prevented them from being discarded. Jesus rescued them from rejection. Jesus put them back into operation. It is written in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy 
has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefined and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Which brings us to our next question for the day. Could it be that someone you know is not in need of a physical rescue today, but is in need of a spiritual rescue? On the road to Emmaus, Jesus rescued two disciples who had lost hope. Because of their lost hope, they were in need of a rescue. It was not a physical rescue they needed. They needed a spiritual rescue. Do you know someone today who is in need of a spiritual rescue? So, we have given a definition of rescue. We have examined two types of rescue, physical and spiritual rescue. Which brings us to another question for the day. What causes the rescue to be necessary in the first place? Or perhaps we should word it this way. We should word it, what are reasons? that someone would need to be rescued. What are reasons which cause a rescue to be required? Well, to give proper review of that question, what are reasons which cause a rescue to be required? Let's take a look at another passage. Let's look in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. Acts 16, beginning with verse 16. Now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul in us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against him, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them secure. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing him to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed his stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. The question was, what are reasons which cause a rescue to be required? Well, sometimes we need to be rescued because of our own actions. Sometimes we need to be rescued because of our own actions. Paul and Silas needed to be rescued because of their own actions, even though their action was a good deed. Paul and Silas were dragging their crowded marketplace. They had false accusations placed on them. They had their torch torn off by the multitude and the magistrates. They were beaten with rods, and they were thrown into prison. Why? Because Paul commanded the wicked spirit to come out of the slave girl. 
And in the name of Jesus, it did. The owners of the slave girl lost their money maker, and Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into prison because of their own actions. You know what? They weren't the only ones who needed to be rescued because of their own actions. Later on in the same story, the keeper of the prison required a rescue, didn't he? The man responsible for keeping the prison was awakened by the earthquake, and he ran into prison, and he saw all the doors open, and he saw all the chains loosened, and he took his own sword to his body to kill himself. In Acts 16.27, it is written, Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. The keeper of the prison was about to kill himself, an action that he took on his own, and he required a rescue. Paul rescued him by saying, Don't do it! There is hope! We're standing right here beside you. Hey, wait a minute. That sounds an awful lot like the story of the two disciples walking to a man. Don't be sad. There's hope. It's standing right next to you. Hmm, interesting. But I know you guys. You're my church family. I know you. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, yeah, yeah. That's ancient history. How about a modern day example of when a rescue is needed because of our own actions? I got a doozy for y'all. Y'all ready? Thanksgiving. Did I say Thanksgiving? Oh, yeah, I said Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's a few months away, but any day of the year you can access YouTube on the internet and watch many videos of actions of people which caused the need for a rescue. Every year, someone, somewhere, decides to fry a turkey for Thanksgiving, and guess what? Every year, someone, somewhere, manages to catch their house on fire because of a Thanksgiving turkey that is fried the wrong way. A rescue becomes necessary for someone because of his or her own actions when a turkey is fried improperly. Watch one of those videos sometimes of an exploding turkey. It's really entertaining. But you know, as silly as that sounds, it's not as silly as a prophet of God thinking he can run away from God and thinking he can hide from God and in attempting to do so, causing his own need to be rescued. Yeah, that really happened. The prophet who did this was, go ahead, say it out loud, Jonah, not Hezekiah, Jonah. Let's take a quick look at that story and read it. Jonah chapter 1. And it is an Old Testament book. Jonah chapter 1. Read the first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, little G there, his God, and threw the, threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten their load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise! Call on your God! Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Where is your country? And what people are you from? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, 
who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to them, To him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm to you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Great fish, now that's a rescue vehicle. So Jonah created his own need to be rescued when he tried to run away from God. Interesting. And that brings us to our next question. Do you know someone who's trying to do that today? Run away from God, I mean. Do you know someone who's trying to run away from God? Attempting to hide from God, I mean. Do you know someone who is creating his own need to be rescued by running away from God? Jonah was a prophet. He knew better. He knew better than to try to hide from God. He couldn't do it. Neither can we. It's written in Psalm 139.7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. You know what? The mariners of that ship, the crew of that ship, they needed a rescue because of their actions too. They allowed Jonah to be a passenger in the cargo ship. It wasn't a cruise ship, it was a cargo ship. They allowed him to pay a fare and be on the ship, even though they knew that Jonah was trying to run from God. How do we know that? Because it's right there in print in Jonah 1.10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Because he told them, before Jonah ever boarded that ship, the mariners asked him why he wanted to be a passenger in the cargo ship. And Jonah told them why. Because of their own actions of accepting Jonah as a paying passenger, they soon required a rescue. So, we've given a definition of a rescue. We've examined two types of rescues, a physical rescue and a spiritual rescue. We've also given one answer to the question, what are rescues which cost Sorry, what are reasons which cause a rescue to be required? One reason that a rescue is required, our own actions. Sometimes, however, we need to be rescued because of someone else's actions. Sometimes the reason we need to be rescued is because of someone else's actions. When we first started our Bible lesson today, I asked you to turn to the book of Hezekiah. There is no such book in the Bible. It was my actions which misled you. It was my misinformation which caused you to go down an improper path. It was my instruction which caused you to be led on a course that leads to failure. That leads us to the next question for the day. Do you know someone who's been led astray? Do you know someone who's on the wrong path? He's going the wrong direction. He's on the road to failure because of the actions of someone else. Do you know someone who needs to be rescued because of the actions of someone else? I told you earlier that I'm a licensed adjuster. One day, very recently, I had to wait outside the office of an attorney to talk to him about a case. I went to the office of that attorney, and he was busy. I had to wait for him to finish his task. 
before I could talk to him about a case. I sat down right outside his office, and he had a paralegal that worked with him that was just almost inches away from me. Her desk was very close to where I was sitting. As I sat to wait to talk to this attorney, this paralegal received an email that she opened, and it had a video clip on it. She placed a video clip on her computer, and it was right in front of me. I was waiting on the attorney, and she played this video clip, and my eyes went straight to it. I didn't know what I was about to watch. She played a video clip sent to her by email. And I watched it without warning. The video was a film of an actual event. It was taken by a handheld electronic device like, a, like an iPhone. The video was of a multi-vehicle motor vehicle accident on the highway. And what made this video so horrific was that it involved multiple 18-wheel tractor trailers and one standard-sized passenger car that was packed in the middle of it. And it was the video showed that the car trapped between these 18 wheelers was on fire. And the people inside the car burned to death. They were trapped. They required a rescue. They needed to be rescued. And no one could get to them. I watched the video of people burned to death in their car. They needed to be rescued. And it was not possible. You know, that video really upset me, you can't tell. It affected me in a significant manner. I viewed it without warning, without anyone warning me, without having any knowledge of its content, and because of the actions of someone else, I viewed it. After watching that video of those people trapped in a burning car, burning to death, I needed a rescue. Emotionally, I was cast into a horrible pit. I needed to be pulled out of it and put back on solid ground. Then I remembered the words of our Lord written in Psalm 40, verses 1 and 10. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and establish my steps. I cannot help but go on to our next question for the day and ask you, do you know someone like that? Do you know someone who's in a horrible pit emotionally, who needs to be rescued and put on dry ground? Do you know someone like that? So, we've given a definition of a rescue, we have examined two types of rescue, physical res rescue and spiritual rescue. We've also given two answers to the question. The question, what are reasons which cause a rescue to be required? One, our own action. A second reason that a rescue is required, the action of others. Now I've got another question for you this morning. Could it be that someone requires a rescue not from his own action, not even from the actions of another person, but for reasons that no one's to blame for it. You know, we're really good at finding something or someone to blame for a problem we have. We find blame for a problem. Sometimes we are to blame for a need for rescue. Sometimes others are, but could it be that we need a rescue from an issue and yet no one is to blame? Well, perhaps we can answer that question with a review from a passage from the book of John. Not Hezekiah, the book of John, chapter 9. John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1, reads, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night is coming, 
when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he sat on the ground. He made clay with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated, sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. So, what was the event that caused the man in this passage to be blind? He was born. He was blind from birth. It was not his fault. He was blind. He was born that way. Was it the sins of his mother or father that caused him to be born blind? Answer, no. Because Jesus himself said so, found in verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned. So why was he born blind? Again in verse 3, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. He needed to be rescued so that God would be honored. He needed a rescue so God would be glorified. He needed a rescue to reveal the mighty work of Almighty God. Could it be? Could it be that you have been blaming yourself for a matter that may not actually be your fault? Could it be that you've been blaming somebody else for a matter that's really not, not someone else's fault? Could it be? Could it be that you need to be rescued today to reveal the mighty works of the God of all creation. Jesus rescued that blind man. No what? After Jesus rescued that blind man, he didn't go around complaining of all his years of blindness. What he said, as found in verse 25, was this. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see Jesus still makes the blind to see, even today. Oh, <laughs> I just picked up on your brainwaves. You thought I couldn't hear it, didn't you? You thought I didn't know what you were thinking, but I felt it all the way up here. Well, at least one person is probably thinking this. You're saying to yourself, you know, I've been waiting, and I've been waiting, and I've been waiting for my rescue. I've been waiting for my rescue. I've been asked. I've tried to be rescued. Why has it taken so much time? Why has it taken so much time? Well, I have an answer for you this morning. I don't know. I don't know, but think of this. How do you know your rescue isn't going to happen today? Think about the blind man in that passage. In verse 1 of chapter 9, it's written, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man, who was a man who was blind from birth. You think that blind man had any idea that his blindness was going to come to an end that day? You really think he woke up that morning saying, Yes, this is the day I've been waiting for. Today, I'm going to finally see. Jesus passed by him and rescued him. Have you asked Jesus to rescue you? Have you asked Jesus to pass by and rescue you? You know, perhaps you never, ever asked Jesus to rescue you because you just don't believe He will. Perhaps you find the thought of being rescued by Jesus as really, really intriguing, but just cannot believe it could actually be true. You think the idea of a rescue by Jesus, just like Hollywood make-believe. Matter of fact, this whole morning, all this time that we've been talking about being rescued, the only thing you could think of was these characters. enough of that. Oh, those crazy castaways of Gilligan's Island. Always in need of a rescue. 
always searching for a rescue, always involved in some kind of strange, unexpected, unexplained circumstance, always coming ever so close to being rescued, and then the stupid Gilligan goes and misses everything else. They're right back where they started, on a desert island, stranded with the professor who knows how to make batteries last for dozens of years with a bamboo bicycle. Let me ask you something. You don't really think of your life as an episode of Gilligan's Gaia. Do you? In John 10, 10, the Bible gives words that Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In John 14, 6, the Bible reads that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, the words of Jesus are recorded as, Come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We are told in the announcement by an angel of the Lord as found in Matthew one twenty one, speaking of Mary, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people. Jesus will save, will rescue. It doesn't read maybe he will. It doesn't mean perhaps he will. It doesn't mean, it doesn't read, there's a good chance that he will. The verse reads, Jesus will save. So we finally get to our last question of the day. And it's the most important one of all. You ready for it? Because it's actually your question for me. The question is, so what? So what? Jonathan, so what? You've been talking over 20 minutes about rescue. So what? You gave a definition. You gave examples. You gave illustrations about rescue. So what? So what? So what is the rescue that you need today? So what is the rescue that you need today. Perhaps it's a rescue from physical illness that you need. Perhaps it's a rescue from an addiction that you need. Perhaps it's a rescue from anger and blame that you've been carrying for year after year after year that you need today. Perhaps it's a rescue from years of guilt that you need today. Perhaps the rescue you need today is to be delivered from religion and rescued by Jesus to a personal, intimate, saving relationship with Jesus as your God and friend. So what is the rescue that you need today? Will you bow your head, please? As the band comes back up and begins to play, please do not be distracted. This very moment is more important than any distraction around you. Today, you can be rescued. Today, you can cry out to God and reach out for the lifeline that He will throw to you. Our church elders will be at the cross to pray with you if that is your desire. The front of the stage is an altar to Almighty God if you want to come and kneel before the Lord and pray to yourself. And if you really don't need a rescue today, please pray for the person next to you. For you do not know what rescue he or she needs today. God is willing. God is able to rescue you. Do not waste time this morning. Ask God for your ultimate rescue today. Dear God, I pray that everyone 
push aside all distractions and all obstacles and go to you for the rescue you have. I leave you in the hands of the Holy Spirit at this time.